following the renowned Michelson-Morley experiment on ether. As discussed in episode 2, various physicists, including the Dutch scientist Hendrik Lorentz, endeavoured to interpret its results. They proposed several concepts to explain the findings, such as the contraction of objects in the direction of motion and the slowing down of clocks when moving through the hypothetical ether. The ether was initially conceived as a medium through which light propagated. However, in 1905, Albert Einstein, then a relatively unknown clerk at the Swiss patent office, revolutionized the understanding of this concept. In a seminal paper, Einstein disagreed with the idea of the ether. He didn't think it was necessary to keep believing in it. His argument rested on his willingness to abandon the notion of absolute time. Coincidentally, a similar perspective was articulated a few weeks later by Henry Poincaré, a leading French mathematician of the time. Indeed, Einstein's arguments against the concept of ether were notably grounded in physics, reflecting a departure from the classical notion, influenced by Newton and Aristotle's philosophy, that time is absolute, implying the existence of a universal clock that ticks uniformly for all observers, regardless of their motion or position in the universe. Einstein's emphasis on abandoning the notion of absolute time and challenging established ideas about space and motion laid the foundation for his groundbreaking theories of relativity. Henry Poincaré brought a distinct perspective to the re-evaluation of existing concepts related to the ether and the nature of space and time. Unlike Einstein, Poincaré's emphasis was more rooted in mathematical formalism. While both scientists recognized the need for a reassessment, Poincaré's approach was to scrutinize the mathematical structure of theories. Poincaré made significant contributions to the understanding of dynamics and the three-body problem in celestial mechanics, and he had a keen interest in the foundations of mathematics. His work laid the groundwork for chaos theory and the development of what would later be called the Poincaré occurrence theorem. It's worth noting that while Einstein and Poincaré approached the problem from different angles, one more focused on the physical implications and the other on mathematical structures, their parallel contributions played a crucial role in the transformative period of physics during the early 20th century. Although Einstein is generally credited with the development of the new theory, Poincaré's contributions are also acknowledged. General relativity and special relativity are two fundamental theories formulated by Albert Einstein that transformed our understanding of space, time, and gravity. Special relativity, developed in 1905, focuses on the relationship between space and time for observers moving at constant relative velocities. The key principles of special relativity include the following. 1. Constancy of the speed of light. The speed of light is the same for all observers, regardless of their motion or the motion of the light source. 2. Relativity of space and time. Space and time are interconnected in a four-dimensional framework known as space-time. Events that are simultaneous for one observer may not be for another moving at a different velocity. 3. Time dilation. Time is relative and can pass at different rates for observers moving relative to each other. An observer moving at high speed experiences time more slowly. 4. Length contraction. Objects moving at high speeds contract in the direction of motion as observed by a relatively stationary observer. 5. Mass energy equivalence, that is, E equal mc square. This famous equation states that mass and energy are interchangeable. Even a small amount of mass can be converted into a large amount of energy. Einstein's special relativity successfully explained the behavior of objects moving at high speeds, but it did not account for gravity. Newtonian gravity, which worked well for most situations, was inconsistent with the principles of special relativity. So, Einstein sought a unified theory that would encompass both special relativity and Newton's law of universal gravitation. So, in 1915, Einstein developed general relativity, which extends special relativity to include gravity. This general theory of relativity is what gave Einstein fame. The key principles of general relativity include the following. 1. Curvature of space-time. Gravity is not a force between masses, but is instead the curvature of space-time caused by mass and energy. Objects move along curved paths in this curved space-time. 2. Equivalence principle. Locally, the effects of gravity are indistinguishable from acceleration. 3. Gravitational time dilation. Clocks in stronger gravitational fields tick more slowly. 4. Gravitational lensing. Gravity can bend the path of light. 5. Prediction of black holes. 
General relativity predicts the existence of black holes regions where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. Let's explore the theory of relativity in greater detail to gain a clearer understanding. The idea that the laws of physics should be the same for all observers in free motion, irrespective of their speed, marked a revolutionary departure from classical mechanics. This postulate not only extended the principles of Newtonian physics, but also encompassed Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, particularly in relation to the constancy of the speed of light. The profound implications of this postulate include one of the most famous equations in physics, E equal mc squared. This equation reveals the equivalence of mass and energy, showing that they are interchangeable. The increase in energy associated with an object's motion corresponds to an increase in its mass. And as an object approaches the speed of light, the amount of energy required to further accelerate it becomes increasingly significant. For example, when an object travels at 10% of the speed of light, its mass is only 0.5% greater than its rest mass. Rest mass refers to the mass of an object when it is at rest. It is an intrinsic property, meaning it is independent of the object's motion or the observer's frame of reference. It is the minimum mass an object possesses, and as the object accelerates and approaches the speed of light, its relativistic mass, which includes the rest mass plus the mass of an object in motion, increases. At 90% of the speed of light, its mass would be over twice its rest mass. As an object approaches the speed of light, its mass increases at an ever-accelerating rate, making it require more and more energy to achieve further acceleration. In practice, it becomes impossible for any normal object to reach or exceed the speed of light because its mass would approach infinity, and the energy needed to accelerate it to such speeds would be infinite as well. As a result, objects, in accordance with the theory of relativity, are forever restricted from traveling at or beyond the speed of light. Only light and other massless waves can attain the speed of light. In Newtonian physics, which predates relativity, there was a concept of absolute time. In this view, if a pulse of light was sent from one place to another, different observers would agree on the time the journey took, because time was considered an absolute and universal entity. In other words, it emphasizes that if you undergo a one-minute experience, every object and entity in the universe also goes through a one-minute experience simultaneously, without any variation. This universality of the experience of time holds true regardless of factors like motion and location. Their idea is that time remains constant and consistent for everyone and everything in the universe. However, they would not necessarily agree on how far the light traveled, since space was not considered an absolute and invariant concept. This meant that different observers would measure different speeds for the light, because the speed of light is the distance it has traveled divided by the time it has taken. In contrast, the theory of relativity, particularly special relativity, introduced a significant change. According to this theory, all observers must agree on how fast light travels. While they now agree on the speed of light, they still do not agree on the distance the light has traveled. Consequently, they must also disagree on the time it has taken. In simple terms, to uphold the constant speed of light, the relationship between distance and time must change proportionally. The ratio between distance and time remains constant. In this view, the concept of absolute time is abandoned. Each observer has their own measure of time, recorded by a clock carried with them. Identical clocks carried by different observers will not necessarily agree. Observers in the theory of relativity can use radar to determine the location and time of an event by sending out a pulse of light or radio waves. Part of the pulse reflects back at the event, and the observer measures the time at which they receive the echo. The time of the event is then considered to be the midpoint between when the pulse was sent and when the reflection was received back. The distance of the event is calculated as half the time taken for this round trip multiplied by the speed of light. This leads to a crucial concept in relativity called space-time, where time and space are no longer considered separate and independent entities. They are intertwined into a single four-dimensional construct known as space-time. This concept implies that events in the universe are not only defined by their spatial coordinates, but also by when they occur. Observers who are in motion relative to each other will assign different times and positions to the same event. However, no observer's measurements are more correct than any others. They are all related. Any observer can calculate precisely what time and position another observer will assign to an event, 
provided they know the relative velocity between them. This concept is fundamental to the theory of relativity and has practical applications in modern physics. In modern measurements, distance is often defined in terms of time and the speed of light. For example, the meter is defined as the distance light travels in 3.33 times 10 to the power of negative 9 seconds, as measured by a cesium clock. A more precise number is shown on the screen. This definition is based on the concept that the speed of light is constant, and it has practical advantages for precise measurements. Similarly, a new unit of length, called a light second, is defined as the distance light travels in one second. The theory of relativity removes the need for the concept of the ether. Instead, it forces a fundamental change in our understanding of space and time, bringing them together into the unified concept of space-time. In everyday experience, we often describe the position of a point in space using three numbers or coordinates. For instance, we can specify that a point in a room is a certain distance from different walls and the floor. Alternatively, we might use latitude, longitude, and height above sea level to describe a location. These three coordinates can vary based on the context, but they are limited in their range of applicability. For instance, we wouldn't describe the position of the moon in terms of miles north and west of a location in a particular city and feet above sea level. Instead, celestial objects like the moon might be described in terms of their distance from the sun, their position in the plane of the planet's orbits, and their angular relation to other celestial objects like Alpha Centauri. Even with these different coordinate systems, they may not be sufficient to describe the position of objects on larger cosmic scales, such as the position of our sun within our galaxy or the position of our galaxy within the local group of galaxies. Therefore, the universe can be described as a collection of overlapping patches, each of which uses a different set of coordinates to specify the position of a point within that patch. An event, in the context of this discussion, is something that occurs at a specific point in space and at a particular time. Therefore, it can be described using four numbers or coordinates. Just as with spatial coordinates, the choice of coordinates for describing an event is arbitrary. In relativity, there is no fundamental distinction between space and time coordinates. This concept is similar to the idea that there's no real difference between any two spatial coordinates. This flexibility in coordinate systems is a fundamental aspect of the theory of relativity. The concept of space-time is introduced as a four-dimensional space that combines three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. While it's challenging to visualize four dimensions, it is relatively easy to draw two-dimensional diagrams that represent aspects of space-time. An example of a space-time is given in this diagram. Time is measured upward in years, and the horizontal distance represents the space between the Sun and Alpha Centauri, which is measured in miles. The paths of the Sun and Alpha Centauri in space-time are shown as vertical lines on the left and right of the diagram, and a ray of light from the Sun follows the diagonal line. It takes four years to get from the Sun to Alpha Centauri. Maxwell's equations predict that the speed of light is constant, regardless of the speed of the source. This has been confirmed by accurate measurements. As a result, when a pulse of light is emitted from a specific point in space at a particular time, it spreads out as a sphere of light in space-time. The size and position of this sphere are independent of the source's speed. The spreading of light is likened to ripples on the surface of a pond when a stone is thrown in, creating expanding circles. A light cone represents all the possible paths that light emitted from a specific event can take, given that the speed of light is constant in all directions. These light cones are identical for all events and point in the same direction, illustrating the constancy of the speed of light and its universal nature. The light spreading out from an event forms a three-dimensional cone in four-dimensional space-time. This cone is called the future light cone of the event. It represents the region in space-time where light from the event can reach as time progresses. Similarly, another cone called the past light cone can be drawn. This represents the set of events in space-time from which a pulse of light could have reached the given event. The cone shape emerges from the fact that information, or causal influence, cannot propagate faster than the speed of light. So, at time equals zero, the event is like the tip of the cone. It represents the present moment. As time progresses, the influence of the event spreads outward in all directions at the speed of light. This means that after one second, the influence has reached a radius of one light second. 
after two seconds, it has reached a radius of two light seconds, and so on. When you connect all these points, it resembles a cone. If we imagine a hypothetical scenario where information or causal influence could propagate instantaneously or faster than light, then the influence of an event could reach any distance in no time. This would indeed change the shape from a cone to a sphere, as the event could influence its entire surroundings instantaneously. It's crucial to note that this is a simplification for visualization purposes, and the actual space-time geometry is more complex. The light cones of points near the massive object would be bent inward due to the object's mass. The concept of a past light cone is similar to that of a future light cone, but pertains to events in the past that could have influenced a given event at a specific point in space-time. It helps us understand what events in the past might have had an impact on the situation you find yourself in at this moment. These concepts and diagrams help physicists and scientists visualize the relationships between events and the influence of the speed of light on the structure of space-time. Light cones are particularly important for understanding causality and the limits imposed by the finite speed of light in the universe. They provide a powerful tool for conceptualizing the interconnected nature of space and time. These are events that can be reached from event P by a particle or wave traveling at or below the speed of light. They are considered to be in the future of event P and are depicted within or on the expanding sphere of light emitted from P. In space-time diagrams, these events fall within or on the future light cone of P. Events in the future of P can be influenced by what happens at P because nothing in the universe can travel faster than light. Therefore, any changes or influences originating from event P will propagate at or below the speed of light, affecting events within the future light cone. In simple terms, events from your past can influence what's happening now, and the past light cone helps us visualize which past events could have affected your present. Just as events in the future can be influenced by your actions now, your past actions have shaped your present, and these influences are represented within the past light cone. Events that neither lie in the future or in the past of event P are said to be in the elsewhere of P. These events are beyond the reach of P's influence, and they cannot affect or be affected by what happens at P. Let's consider a real-life example. If the sun were to suddenly stop shining, it would not have an immediate impact on events on Earth at the present moment. This lack of impact is because events on Earth are in the elsewhere of the event when the sun stopped shining. Information about the sun's cessation of shining would take time to reach Earth, as it would travel at the speed of light. Similarly, we do not know what is happening at a moment farther away in the universe. The light reaching us from distant galaxies initiated its journey millions of years ago. The special theory of relativity successfully explains that the speed of light appears the same to all observers, as demonstrated by the famous Michelson-Morley experiment. However, a challenge arose when trying to reconcile this theory with Newtonian gravity. According to Newton, objects are attracted to each other with a force that depends on their distance. This would imply an instantaneous change in the gravitational force if an object were moved, which contradicts the finite speed of light required by the special theory of relativity. Einstein attempted various approaches to harmonize his theory of special relativity with gravity between 1908 and 1914, but faced difficulties. Finally, in 1915, he introduced the general theory of relativity. In this theory, he proposed the groundbreaking idea that gravity is not a conventional force, but instead a consequence of the curvature of space-time caused by the distribution of mass and energy within it. Objects, like the Earth, move along the closest thing to a straight path, known as a geodesic, in this curved space-time. To illustrate this, let us see the example of a two-dimensional curved space, such as the surface of the Earth, where a geodesic is represented by a great circle, the shortest path between two points. Although objects in general relativity always follow straight lines in four-dimensional space-time, their paths appear curved to observers in our familiar three-dimensional space. This is akin to observing an airplane flying over hilly terrain. While it follows a straight line in three-dimensional space, its shadow on the two-dimensional ground appears curved. The mass of the Sun, according to general relativity, causes space-time to curve in such a way that even though the Earth follows a straight path in four-dimensional space-time, it seems to follow an elliptical path around the Sun in three-dimensional space. The orbits of planets predicted by general relativity closely match those predicted by Newton's theory, with subtle differences. 
For example, for Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, general relativity predicts that the long axis of its elliptical orbit should slowly rotate around the Sun at a rate of about 1 degree every 10,000 years. This prediction was significant because, even though the effect is small, it was observed before 1915 and served as one of the initial confirmations of Einstein's theory. Another significant prediction of general relativity is gravitational lensing. According to this theory, the curvature of space-time causes light to deviate from straight-line paths, particularly when it encounters massive objects like the Sun. For instance, it is anticipated that the light cones of points near the Sun will be slightly bent inward due to the Sun's mass. This implies that light from a distant star, if it passes near the Sun, would be deflected by a small angle, making the star appear in a different position when observed from Earth. The situation becomes even more intriguing when the Earth orbits the Sun. From our perspective, different stars appear to pass behind the Sun, and their light is affected by the Sun's gravitational field, resulting in apparent shifts in their positions relative to other stars. Detecting this phenomenon can be quite challenging because the Sun's intense light makes it nearly impossible to observe stars in close proximity to it in the sky. However, there is a unique opportunity to observe this light deflection during a solar eclipse. When the Moon comes between the Earth and the Sun, it blocks out the Sun's light for a brief period. This allows astronomers to study the positions of stars that are located close to the Sun in the sky, free from the Sun's overwhelming brightness. The prediction of light deflection proposed by Einstein could not be tested immediately in 1915 due to the ongoing First World War. It was not until 1919 that a British scientific expedition during a solar eclipse observed in West Africa demonstrated that light is indeed bent by the Sun's gravitational field, precisely as predicted by Einstein's theory. Another intriguing prediction of general relativity is gravitational time dilation. This prediction stems from a fundamental relationship between the energy of light and its frequency, which represents how many light waves pass a given point per second. Essentially, the higher the energy of light, the greater its frequency. However, in the gravitational field of the Earth, as light travels upwards, it loses energy. Consequently, its frequency decreases, meaning the time between one wave crest and the next becomes longer. From the perspective of someone at a higher altitude, it would seem as though time is passing more slowly for objects or observers at lower elevations. This effect can be envisioned as if everything down below is experiencing time in a more dilated manner. In 1962, this prediction was put to the test using a pair of highly precise clocks positioned at the top and bottom of a water tower. The clock located at the bottom, which was closer to the Earth's massive gravitational influence, was observed to run at a slower rate providing a precise confirmation of Einstein's general theory of relativity. This experimental result demonstrated that the difference in the speed of clocks at different heights above the Earth is not merely a theoretical concept, but a real and measurable effect. This phenomenon of time dilation due to gravity has practical implications today, especially with the development of incredibly accurate navigation systems that rely on signals from satellites. If one were to disregard the predictions of general relativity, the positions calculated using these satellite signals would be significantly off, leading to navigation errors of several miles. Therefore, our understanding of how gravity influences the passage of time has become crucial to modern technology and precise global positioning systems. Isaac Newton's laws of motion revolutionized our understanding of the universe by challenging the notion of absolute position in space. However, it was Albert Einstein's theory of relativity that took the next step by challenging the concept of absolute time. To illustrate this, let's consider a hypothetical scenario involving a pair of twins. Imagine two identical twins. One of them decides to live atop a mountain, while the other remains at sea level. In this situation, a fascinating phenomenon occurs. The twin living at the higher altitude would age slightly faster than the one at sea level. The difference in their ages would be very small, as the effect is relatively minor in such circumstances. However, the concept of time dilation becomes significantly more pronounced if one of the twins embarks on an extended journey through space in a spacecraft, traveling at a velocity near the speed of light. Upon returning to Earth, the traveling twin would be noticeably younger than the one who remained on our planet. This intriguing scenario is commonly known as the twins paradox. You can watch our video titled Twins and Relativity for further detail. 
it's crucial to understand that the twin paradox only appears paradoxical when we hold on to the idea of absolute time. Before 1915, the prevailing view in physics held that space and time were fixed and unchanging entities where events occurred without any influence on the fabric of space and time itself. Even the special theory of relativity, proposed by Einstein, described the motion of bodies and the forces acting on them. But space and time remained constant and unaffected. At that time, it was a common belief that space and time extended infinitely. However, a significant transformation occurred with the introduction of the general theory of relativity. This new theory presents a completely different perspective on space and time. In the context of general relativity, space and time are dynamic and interconnected entities. When a body moves or a force is exerted, it alters the curvature of space and time in the vicinity. In turn, the geometry of space-time influences how bodies move and how forces manifest. This mutual interaction implies that space and time are not only passive backdrops, but are also influenced by all the events and phenomena occurring in the universe. In the context of general relativity, it became meaningless to discuss space and time beyond the boundaries of the universe. The notion of space and time was inextricably linked to the events and structures within the universe. The prevailing view was that the universe was static and unchanging. To maintain a static universe, Einstein introduced a cosmological constant into his equations, a term denoted by the Greek letter lambda. The cosmological constant acts as a repulsive force on cosmological scales, counteracting the gravitational attraction between matter. Later, in 1929, Edwin Hubble's observations of distant galaxies revealed that the universe was, in fact, expanding. This discovery challenged the static universe model that Einstein had initially envisioned. Feeling that the cosmological constant was unnecessary, Einstein referred to it as his greatest blunder. This is what we will address in the next episode.